Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. One of my favourite features in Rust is the rich type system. It doesn't just check you've used the right type of a variable, but allows you to build your own complex model with deep, rich integration with your problem domain. Today I'm going to show you how to make invalid states unrepresentable, using three techniques that align perfectly with Rust's powerful types and compiler. We're going to talk about algebraic type systems, data normalization, and state machines. Everything you see in this video, from the script to the images, are part of a Markdown document available on GitHub under a public domain license. Most popular languages have product types. The first example here of a point is a product. This is like a class or a C style struct. It's a container for a number of attributes. The second type here, web event, an enum, is not typically a core part of popular languages. So called enums in other languages are typically an enumeration over a set of integers, assigning them a name. Bit flags or types of a message. They're rubbish. Rust enums are different. They are proper algebraic sum types, sometimes called tagged unions. The difference between sum and product types is simple. A fake cat here could be written in any popular languages with a normal class or a struct in Rust. It's fine, but requires runtime verification that a dead cat can't be hungry. I'd be worried if it were. It's the most natural thing to model this with Rust's fat enums. Only the alive variant has the extra hungry attribute. There's nothing to check with the real cat. The only two valid states are alive and dead, and because you've enforced this with the type system, you gain safety, guarantees, and superpowers. For example, if you use enums, then the Rust compiler stops you making mistakes. This is not valid Rust here. I have made a mistake. Can you see it? Unlike an if statement, which can do anything and is not bound to the type system, a match expression works with the type system. I forgot to handle one of the two states. If I had used an if statement or primitive types, I'd be none the wiser. Because I used an enum and a match, the compiler knows what I am talking about and kept me safe. The compiler even told me how to fix my error at the bottom here. We're going to build our state system using the match expression today, so let's look at what it can give us. Rust provides pattern matching via the match keyword, which can be used like a C style switch. The first matching arm is evaluated, it short circuits and all possible values must be covered by the branches. This is enforced by the compiler. Here we are matching on, in order, a value, a set of values, a range of values, or wildcards. Note that we are using the runtime value inside the integer here. We can match on both the compile time type and the runtime value. To get the extreme safety I talk about, you must enrich your model with the type system, not just use anonymous numbers and strings. There's no runtime overhead in doing so. In Rust, at runtime, they are indeed just numbers and strings. The CPU will be none the wiser. It's one of Rust's many zero-cost abstractions. But at compile time, where you and I exclusively live, we enrich the data with types. Part 1. Algebraic type systems. Object orientation is weird, if you think about it. If you want a class, you better bring in all the parents of that class. Reuse in object-oriented systems is near zero. Most object-oriented languages solve the diamond problem by just not allowing multiple inheritance. Oh great, what a clever solution. Who is flying this thing? We don't design database tables like this. We don't build companies like this. We've created, through anthrocentrism, a system that doesn't model the world. It just models cats and dogs and genetics for some reason. And shoehorning our real world into an inheritance model causes real problems all the time. Shrug off object orientation as Rust does, and you are left with a simpler, better world. If you have an algebraic type system, like Rust has with enums, you just don't need any of the rubbish that object orientation loads you down with. Small talk might have worked, I suppose, but the way OO is implemented in Python, Ruby, JavaScript, Java, and C++ is full of compromises to allow escape hatches out to the actual world of data and functions in order to work. Why not just do data and functions really, really well to start with? Guess what? Rust does. But how do we model our data, if not through classes and inheritance? How can we replace a whole industry's experience designing data? My answer, after a word from returning sponsor, Quadratic. Quadratic are building an open source spreadsheet for engineers and data scientists built in Rust, WebAssembly, and WebGL. Quadratic combines the functional data visualization of a spreadsheet with the power of full programming languages, starting with Python. Standard Python data science libraries are built in. In fact, because Quadratic are using Pyodide inside WebAssembly, any pure Python dependency can be installed, like this example of the Faker library. Because all of Python is running locally inside WebAssembly, complex work such as here pulling data from an API is possible. 
This is all running at 60 FPS on the GPU using WebGL, all inside your browser. Quadratic built their infinite canvas on WebGL, allowing for smooth scrolling and pinch to zoom. They have recently released GPT integration, giving you a co-pilot or pair programmer while you're writing. Fantastic. It's open source and free to use. Sign up today. Head to Quadratic HQ to try it out. My thanks to Quadratic for their support of this channel. The answer is that we're not replacing a whole industry's experience modeling data. I'm not going to teach you anything new today. I'm going to recommend thinking about your data like we do in a database and applying the ancient principles of normalization to design it. Tables existed long before object orientation and will exist long after OO is a distant memory. You know how our industry is divided between people who love ORMs because they bring database into the object-oriented world of our language, say Java or Ruby, and people who love DALs, bringing the world of structured data into our object-oriented languages. This schism shouldn't exist. It's artificial. OO has messed it all up. Tables model the real world much better than inheritance models the real world. Let's just use tables in our language model. Rust structs can model tables in a one-to-one -one manner. This example is adapted from the Diesel Query Builder for Rust, my second favorite database connection tool behind SQLX. Let's step through this example and see how we can improve it through normalization. For some reason, there are lots of different normal forms. You know how computer scientists love to make up stuff. We're going to talk about third normal form and just call it a day, like the rest of the world does. These rules are honestly common sense, and you do nearly all of them by yourself. However, Knowing the rules of third normal form will save you from data design mistakes later. You can forget the gang of four patterns, but you must remember normalization. Here's the post struct from earlier. We've now got the structs in normal form. The data is split up into sensible structs with data like author and image loosely coupled so that multiple authors can write multiple posts and images can be reused. Depending on how relational the data is in your program, you may want to drop the IDs or inline a linking table. That's all good. We're not strictly optimizing for querying, we're just trying to get a handle on our data design. Also, note the image tuple struct here. This allows us to create a new type that wraps a built-in type. Image posts need an image, not just any old string. Now you've refreshed your memory on data design, let's talk about making invalid states unrepresentable with state machines. I searched for a non-boring example of a state machine for days when researching this video. State machines are good, but they're not very interesting. Circles are states and arrows are transitions between the states. If you like the science behind this, Computerfile have a great video series on the subject, links in the source code. Their video is good, but their examples of a turnstile or vending machine were rather dull. I had lost all hope. But then, I was looking through the Super Mario World manual the other day, and I found this amazing graphic on page 11. Let's zoom in. We've got states and transitions. It's a state machine. I think everyone in the world might be familiar with at least two of the states in this graph. Let's build this state machine in Rust and see how to make invalid Marios unrepresentable. Build the valid states of your system with Rust's powerful enums. Every Mario on the graph is a new state. We've got Mario, Super Mario, Fire Mario, and Cape Mario. Though we will keep things simple today, Rust's fat enums can contain as much data as you like as you see here in this unrelated example. Enums can contain structs, and structs can contain enums. Let's model our transitions. Again, we've modeled our transitions as an enum, and again, if we wanted to add more data to the transition, we could add it here. The first line, adding the debug attribute, should be familiar to you if you've written your own structs before. They simply allow us to debug print our new type. The last line is a little hack to allow me to refer to the transitions by their unqualified name. I also did this for the states. This will make our examples shorter today, but for non-trivial programs, you should use the fully qualified name, like I have here with Transition Flower. We're nearly done. We have the states and the transitions. Now we must map the valid transitions between the states. Here are the rules of our state machine. First, we build a player struct to hold our state. This is the long-lived top-level struct of your app. If you're building a UI, this is the window. If you're building a web server, this is the server app, which contains the DB connection, etc. We implement the new method constructor for our player, setting the default state as Mario. World 1-1, one, one, here we come. The collect method is the only valid way to move between states. The input to this function is what kind of power-up Mario has collected, and this is passed into our match expression. This expression is where our rules for valid state changes happen. There are a few ways of doing this. You could use nested match expressions for more complex systems, 
perhaps using helper functions to split up the match into functions or even entire modules. With a simple state machine, I recommend putting the state and transition event into a tuple and matching on that. While developing your state, the type system and match expressions keep you safe. And because this compiles, I know I have covered all cases. And here's our little state machine in action. In other languages, we'd have to do a lot of testing to prove we'd written our arbitrary if statements correctly, and not missed a case or written unreachable cases. Gross. There are no edge cases here. I only have to scrutinize the match expression to ensure the business logic is implemented correctly. And when I need to change the states, perhaps in Super Mario 64, it's easy, and the compiler will tell us what match statements need updating. State machines are everywhere. They're easy to reason about, easy to debug, and if you need to, the tightly defined scope allows them to be formally proved for when human life depends on your system. Model your data with Rust's rich type system, and you will make invalid states unrepresentable. If you would like to support my channel, get early ad-free and tracking-free videos and VIP Discord access, head to patreon.com forward slash noboilerplate. If you're interested in transhumanism and hope punk stories, please check out my sci-fi audio fiction podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, do listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce called Modem Prometheus. Transcripts and compile-checked markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description, and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching, talk to you on Discord.